48 hours into the Russian invasion of Ukraine and Ukraine's capital, the city of Kyiv, is now all but surrounded by Russian forces. And the battle tonight, now early morning Kyiv time, is going to decide, according to the president of Ukraine, whether or not Vladimir Putin is able to take over that country or not. Right, and, and we're watching the citizens of Ukraine gather together. I mean, 18,000 uh, are being armed yeah. tonight to protect themselves, uh, to prepare for what is next here uh, as this invasion continues. Ukraine's president says the fate of Ukraine will be decided tonight. Here is what we know at this hour. There were reports of explosions, heavy fighting in the streets, uh, not just in Kyiv, but all across the country tonight. Troops moving in from all sides around the capital city. Ukraine's military and their citizens defending their nation. They're also defending their democracy. They are defending their lives and they will fight. New tonight, the Ukraine military posting on Facebook some success in battle, fending off a Russian attack at a military base in Kyiv. That happening just a short time ago. And really the focus right now, Leland, is in Kyiv, the capital city of about four million people uh, surrounded in some areas by water, but this is this is a ground fight at this point as they're trying to fend off these Russian troops. Yeah, and it's soon going to be a street to street fight. We'll head over to the maps in just a minute. You mentioned the 18,000 residents who've now been deputized into a militia of some type. Uh, I got this from someone on the ground, a military commander in the Ukrainian military, uh, talking about those. Uh, my friend, the commander of the unit from Vostok, said goodbye to me. He is unlikely to be able to survive. Uh, in Kyiv, the army weapons were distributed to the population. These people do not know how, but they will fight. It's pretty stunning. Uh, and in terms of what they are fighting against, this is the newest video in. We do not have live shots anymore from downtown Kyiv. Those have been pulled down. You can see there's a lot of buildings without electricity. This is a fight going on outside the zoo in Kyiv. And by zoo, we mean the actual zoo where animals are being kept. That's about right here in Kyiv. This is the main downtown of Kyiv here. This is where the presidential palace is. We don't know where the president himself is. We are led to believe that the Russians dropped airborne troops here 48 hours ago, maybe about 50 hours ago, the main military airport just to the northwest of Kyiv. That means that they thought their tank columns could have come out of Belarus and gotten to the airport in about 12 hours. You don't drop airborne troops in if you don't think the tanks can get there by nightfall. That means this Russian offensive is at least 36 hours behind. The other tank column has come down here. The river runs north to south through the center of Kyiv, and that's turning into a natural barrier. The Ukrainians, we understand, are dropping the bridges here and here to isolate from this tank column. This is where, though, the news has gotten bad for the Ukrainians. The Russians have retaken this military airport. They've moved here. That's the battle of the zoo right here. There's another military airport south right here. The Russians have taken that. That means that they can land planes with heavy weapons and additional men from Russia up here and then fight towards the city and move in. The flanking force that was coming from the east has not yet gotten into Kyiv. And Marnie, the issue tonight is whether or not, and now morning time in Kyiv, whether or not they are going to be able to keep the Russian troops out of the center of the city. And if the Russian troops get to the center of the city, what exactly that street to street combat is going to look like? Because there's a great opportunity at literally every street corner for ambushes of those Russian tanks. Meantime, you've got people in bomb shelters, people sure. are in hiding, but you have citizens in addition to the Ukrainian military who are willing to fight. Do we have any idea in terms of the numbers, what they're up against with these Russian troops? Because it, they're not just in Kyiv, they're spread right. out all across the country. Yeah, it's a fast, it's a perfect question in terms of what exactly the Ukrainians' chances are. We kept hearing 200,000 Russian troops. If we go ahead and go to the map that shows all of Ukraine, you talk about 200,000 troops. Uh, in the military uh, parlance, there's this idea of the tooth to tail ratio. So you may have 200,000 troops that were originally stationed here, down in the Black Sea here, in Crimea here. These were the naval forces. Obviously, there was a force up here and a force here. Then you had the force over here, 200,000 troops. That probably only gives you about 60 to 70,000 troops that could actually move down the teeth of the force that moved south here. We had another column of tanks here. We talked about the big left hook that came around. And then 
this area here, site of an invasion, and then an invasion here at Odessa from the sea, an amphibious assault. You're talking about 60,000 troops, maybe 70 out of all of these. So here around the capital, you may be only talking about 20 or 30,000 troops. It sounds like a big number, Marty, but you better regard a great point. You're talking about a city of three or four million people, 18,000 or so Ukrainians who have home field advantage. The New York City Police Department only has 40,000 sworn officers. We know they have a problem keeping control of New York. And not every citizen is trying to fight and kill them. The Russians face a really, really, really tough battle for the city of Kyiv. Right, and not just in, so the focus tonight is Kyiv because Correct. Putin's goal, his main, his main function in all of this is overthrowing the government, trying to find President Zelensky, taking control of Kyiv, and then essentially taking control of Ukraine. But talk about what's happening in these other areas, kind of urban fighting, um, especially to the east right there, where the troops came in initially. Okay, so here's, here's where the initial Ukrainian line was dug in. Remember, this was the area where the where Vladimir Putin on Tuesday recognized the so-called People's Republic. The Ukrainian force has been dug in here for eight years since I was there in 2014 around the original invasion. These troops have not moved out yet. They're still blocked by the Ukrainian forces. These troops have moved through. They've taken Kharkiv, but they've not been able to push farther west. It's clear the Russian battle plan is way, way behind. There's not been a breakout north of here. They've yet to get any of these key cities. This is probably the force to be the most worried about is up here in Brest at the far western part of Belarus. There's about 40,000 troops, we understand, up here in waiting. Their job would be to move south. Why do they come south is because they would be able to cut off any chance of resupply from Poland or down here in Romania or Slovakia where there would be refuge for these resistance fighters, insurgency fighters that would go up against the Russian army. That has not happened yet. This is where things can get very complicated very quickly. To traditional Russian doctrine says, if you're slowing down and failing to take towns, you carpet bomb them. You use cluster munitions, you drop civilian buildings, you commit any war crime out there, you possibly use chemical weapons. We haven't gotten to that point, but everybody I talked to, including a former uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, says, that is still a very real possibility that if the Russians are bogged down for another couple of days, uh, Vladimir Putin will have a choice of exactly how many civilian casualties he is willing to inflict to get his way. And we have seen that they have been successful in slowing the Russian forces, oh, not yeah. just in that part of the country, but also as they approach Kyiv tonight. Uh, just uh, want to update you, though. We are hearing massive explosions sure. in the capital city of Kyiv tonight. I want to bring in uh, an expert who knows, who knows a lot about how do you defend a city. 30-plus uh, years experience, Lieutenant General Richard Newton. Uh, Lieutenant General, I want to pick up on where Leland left off and in, in sort of the Ukrainian forces being able to slow uh, the siege on the city up until this point. Uh, what is your assessment in terms of their ability and the Ukrainian military's ability uh, to fend off the Russian forces at this point as we look at them uh, coming really from all directions? Absolutely. And, and I think Leland has really set the table for us tonight uh, very effectively. Um, let me just add, though, that we are... Uh, all three of us at this point in our discussion are really uh, trying to really, really try to gather as much as we can information wise. We, we lack uh, significant intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance and so forth. And we're going on a lot of media reports. But that said, uh, Leland, you, you did a commendable job so far to really set the table. Um, again, I am, uh, again, I'm very impressed, frankly, with the Ukrainian military up to this point in terms of their resolve. Uh, and frankly, to put the Russian army uh, uh, out of step or off their timeline. And I think that's been very, uh, uh, very important to this point. That's why it, it has been tough going for the Russians. Uh, they are still not, uh, uh, again, meeting their, their tactical aim points, if you will, in terms of a timeline. And then that, however, the downside of that is, is as Leland alluded to, if they get bogged down, significantly, let's say through the, the daylight hours tomorrow and the next day, uh, they could easily go what I would call, they're gonna go big and go ugly. Uh, and that is what Leland referred to in terms of using uh, significant amounts of air power and, and other means of destruction. Leland, let me offer up something to you also and that, uh, that 
uh, military airport up to about 20 clicks to the northwest of, of Kiev right now. Not only can they use that in terms of, of landing paratroopers and ground forces, but they could also use uh, that airport or that Air Force base uh, as a means to launch close air support, yep. which will be very important as those tanks and other mechanized forces will be coming in from the north. And as you mentioned, coming in from the south, uh, that'll be a key element of their assault uh, and it won't necessarily be with what we would have in, in you know, our, our Air Force or our Air Power in terms of precision fires, but nonetheless, it could be effective. And so for me, uh, just as key as gaining those airports, uh, both to the northwest, as you mentioned, and the south, is to create some firepower from the air. That could be from fixed wing aircraft. Uh, it could also be from their, uh, their attack helicopters. So, yeah, General, Marty, back, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, we, we know they've staged attack helicopters north in Belarus to bring down probably um, right. for this reason. And I, I have to hand it to you because 48 hours ago when we were talking about this, you were making the point the Ukrainian military may be able to hold out for a lot longer than I thought they could, uh, probably because I had spent time with the Ukrainian military in 2014 mm -hmm. in the eastern part of, the, yeah. of Ukraine, and, and they were this sort of very, very, very poor poor excuse for an army. That's clearly uh, changed radically. When you talk about uh, close air support, what do you make of the fact that the uh, Ukrainians are still shooting down Russian transport planes with surface-to-air missiles? The Russians do not have air superiority. How much did that factor into their battle plan and the fact that they don't have it changes things how? Well, I think uh, if you recall back in Desert Storm in January of 1991, and uh, we have a mutual friend uh, now, Lieutenant General Retired Dave Deptula, who was one of the architects of that uh, air campaign. First thing we uh, really strive to do was to gain air superiority right off the bat. Uh, the Russians have not done that. Uh, and they do, by the way, they study our, our doctrine, they study our operations, they study our, our historical uh, um, applications of firepower and so forth. But that has been, uh, it's been a detriment to them. And, and I believe, Leland, that's really gotten them off off kilter here a little bit. Um, whether or not that that is, uh, again, if, if that's how they're going to continue, uh, just, you know, being off a step or two, we'll, we'll, soon, we'll soon know about that, but you're right. Uh, and frankly, they have not taken out to my uh, intel that I've got, at least from talking with a number of folks, that they have not really been able to shut down the eyes and ears of the command and control system for the military, for the Ukrainian military. Uh, they, as you mentioned, uh, it's been rough going to, to get those two airports, which are essential to putting uh, close air support aircraft as well as uh, helicopters and so forth. And so it, it all rolls into a, a real challenge for them. And, and to me, back, back to the Ukrainian military, you're right. 48 hours or so ago, we, uh, you know, the Russians were 10 feet tall and the Ukrainians were five feet tall. Well, neither of them are 10 feet tall. And, and I tell you, the Ukrainians aren't five feet tall. I think they're, again, the Russian military is vastly superior to the Ukrainian military um, just in terms of of equipment and they forgot they had momentum at their side now there's some some pause in that momentum but what they don't have is they don't they're not fighting on their home turf and so this is where we're seeing the the will of the ukrainian military the will of the ukrainian people and there were certainly the political will and the strategic will uh and the leadership of president Zelensky at this very moment so that's working against uh, working against the Russians significantly, and we shouldn't take that for granted. Another point on that is, is we have a tendency, and I'm guilty of this myself, or have been in the past, uh, you know, this this idea that, that Russian military and adversaries, so forth, we, we try to put them into a box that they are indeed seven feet tall when they're only five foot ten or, or six feet. Uh, and so I think that's just something for us to keep in mind. Um, and I was guilty of that myself when we're trying to assess the, the Russian military, Mark, if you recall our shows a couple nights or so ago. Uh, but again, the, the absolute uh, will of the Ukrainian military uh, is going to play out. And especially, I think, as, as we go into hand-to-hand -hand combat, street by street in Kiev here, if they've been doing that for the last couple hours, right. but maybe through the next day or two, will prove to be key in terms of whether or not the Russians are now, again, they're, they're back off another timeline because their strategists and their planners have now regrouped, tried to reset. But if the Ukrainians can stay not necessarily one step ahead, but maybe a half a step ahead, 
You follow my thought process here? I do. Uh, well, let me, let me jump in here real yeah. quick because I think Please. what is critical to this is, is being able, once it comes to it, to supply the Ukrainian military, the Ukrainian mm -hmm. people, with the defense that they need. Um, looking at some of the, those maps earlier, especially on the western portion of Ukraine, um, what are the strategies and some of the logistics in getting them the supplies they need to continue uh, the fight, not just on the ground, um, but across the nation in, a, in other military ways? Well, uh, there there are some uh, supply chains, uh, some lines of what we call communications that you could still provide arms and shipments of, of, uh, of military means to the Ukrainian military. But it'll be difficult because they're so focused right now on defending Kiev and other parts of, of Ukraine and actually get them across Ukraine, probably more so through the west than we could imagine, maybe from the south or sort of east, obviously. But but that that's difficult in itself. Now, but the Russians have the same challenge, too. The longer they're in this, this fight, Martin, the longer their supply chain becomes, their lines of operation, their lines of communication become more and more difficult to resupply them as well. And so, uh, again, that becomes a challenge, especially if they have, uh, if the Ukrainians still have some modicum of air defense and that the Russians have not really been able to achieve total air superiority. And so one will work against the other. So. We're, we're not only in a, in a race of literally tonight, street by street, but we're also in a race of time. The longer the Ukrainian military can hang on, the longer that President Zelensky can, can maintain in power in the capital, uh, the more confounding that gets for the Russians. Now, to go back to Leland's point, though, that does compel the Russians, and it forces them to get more heavy-handed. Uh, than we've probably, than we definitely have seen to this point. And they do have the capability to do that. You recall a couple nights or so ago when they launched TU-95 uh, bear bombers out of, out of England. I've actually flown with the Russian Air Force out of England. Uh, that was several years or so ago. But it's, it's a, again, it, it's, a, it's a fairly long stretch of, of uh, air highway there, but they are willing to provide uh, air power even outside of, of, uh, of Ukraine as well. So, yeah. Lots to wrap up here, but there are some extenuating lines of, of supply that are challenges for both the Russians as well as for, for Ukraine. Yeah. Hey, General, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Your analysis over the past 48 hours. It was good to talk to you. One thing that you mentioned, I think it's an important point. It's one thing, the logistics issues of resupplying the Ukrainian insurgency are certainly significant, although you've got Poland, which is a NATO country. You've got air bases there. You've got the 82nd Airborne. The other issue is the political will to do it. And as far as our reporting is gone and mine has, the decision to continue to provide lethal aid to the Ukrainians by the United States has not yet been made. And what weapons the United States is willing to supply to the Ukrainians is going to make, make or break this. Because you might remember back when the U.S. supplied weapons to the Afghan insurgency in the 80s, the Mujahideen that were fighting the Soviets, they would only supply weapons that couldn't be traced back to the United States. Now does the United States supply, resupply the Ukrainians with the Javelin missiles that are taking out Russian tanks? Suddenly then you have U.S. weapons killing Russians. That's a political decision. Right, and there, that's a much deeper and more dangerous yeah. discussion because as we heard from the White House today, the United States does not want it to get into a war with Russia, uh, two major nuclear powers. Uh, I, I do want to mention for the last couple of nights, we have been showing live images of Kyiv yep. uh, from above the capital city. Because of safety reasons, uh, we are not able to share many of those images tonight, but we are, uh, it is our understanding that there are major explosions happening and, and fighting is happening on the ground as well as these Russian troops move in uh, to Kyiv, the capital, tonight. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.